Where is Sweden headed if it does not commit to strong measures to prevent the spread of the coronavirus within its population? This video mathematically models the spread of this virus based on published data that is freely available in the public domain. It compares the progress of the spread of the virus in Sweden with its spread in Australia. The difference in outcomes between the two lies in the two different approaches taken by each of these two countries. And the data used in this video can be found at the link shown here, which I'll include in the description of the video when published. All right, so Sweden has stayed open for business. Um, it's taken a less restrictive approach to the um, dealing with the virus, the spread of the virus. Uh, it's placed more trust in its population. It's allowed bars, clubs, gyms, restaurants and elsewhere to remain open. Whereas in other countries in Europe and elsewhere, that has not been the case. So it's taken something of a relaxed approach, a less restrictive approach, um, perhaps due to concern for its economy. Uh, but nonetheless, let's have a look at what the data is telling us. All right, so the first confirmed case, and all of this data, by the way, again, reminding you, comes from this website here, which is freely available to everyone. Um, the first confirmed case was the 31st of January, and it remained for some reason the only confirmed case right up to and including the 25th of February before a second case was recorded on the 26th of February. Thereafter, exponential like growth starts to cut in, it starts to act, and the numbers start to rapidly grow. So that as of the 11th of April, there were just over 10,000 cases, 10,151. And this video includes all data up to and including the 11th of April. And I am making this video on the uh, 13th of April. Um, and so I'll have all data up to and including the 11th. All right, graphically, it looks like this. And you can see this is the cumulative number of confirmed cases and you can see the pattern is exponential like in its growth which is what viruses do they spread they grow exponentially this is the number of days since the 31st of january and when we say confirmed cases we're talking about the number of cases that have um, been confirmed through testing by the swedish health authorities and then published now remember with this sort of data you only find the number of cases that you test for if your testing is not wide enough, then you don't pick up all cases and there could be many more in the community that's unknown. Many more individuals freely spreading the virus unknown to the authorities if the testing regime is not wide enough. It does not cover. And in some places, Australia, Britain, elsewhere, many places there's not been enough testing. And some countries like, um, like South Korea, um, Hong Kong and so on, there's been widespread testing. Germany is another one, widespread testing. But that's not true everywhere. And so you only report, you only find those cases which you discover through testing. And that's the limitation of all this data. All right, now, this data you can see has an exponential uh, pattern, mode of behavior. You can see that in the ability to reasonably well fit a curve. It's a reasonable fit, but you can judge for yourself when I show you the data. It's a reasonable fit. There's a general exponential pattern happening here in its growth. The blue curve is an exponential curve, the equation of which is given by here. I'll go through some of the detail here, but as of the 11th of April, um, this is the curve that fits the data best. Um, this any, Anyone can do with a mathematical package or a statistics package, you can fit a curve like this and determine which is the best fit. All right, so how does this work? Well, here's our equation describing the blue curve you saw on the previous slide. Let's pick two successive days, the 8th of April and the 9th of April. And the number of confirmed cases was uh, on that day 8,419. But according to this model, the prediction of this model is that 8,423 cases 0.24 and for the 9th of April the predicted number of cases is 9,178.64. Now it's not possible here to have 0.24 of a case or 0.24 of a person 
I've only included the decimal so that anybody at home, anybody watching this video can take out their calculator, they can check the mathematics and see that it all adds up. Otherwise, it would not be quite correct to include the 0.24 there because you can't have 0.24 of a human being or 0.24 of a case. Um, and so I only do that for mathematical completeness and so that people can check with their calculator and see that the numbers on the screen agree with what's been claimed here. So if we have a look at this number here at the base of this equation here, we have the exponent t minus 1, the, the power of the index is here, t minus 1. This is the base down here. And we want to know what does this mean? Well, if we take the uh, number predicted for the 8th of April, this number here, and we multiply it by this number, this base element here, that times that, we get the next day's predicted value. So in other words, that means that this value here for the 9th of April, the predicted value, is 8.968% larger than the day before. Okay, so take this value here, multiply by that base number here, and you get the next day's value. So that's how this model works, and so on and so on. Or in other words, 8.968% of this value here, the 8th of April, uh, is 0.08968 times the value for that day, the 8th of April, the predicted value. And that gives you this value here. Now take 755.396 and add it to the value for the 8th of April, and you get the next day's predicted value, this one here. So that's how it comes about. Now all of the above means that the rate of growth of this virus in Sweden, as of this, according to this model on the 11th of April, is 8.968% per day. That's what it's saying. Okay, so how well does the model fit the data? Well, early on, not very well. One confirmed case on 31st of January, the model's predicting 24.5. Now, it's an exponential model, so it's gonna grow rapidly, as you can see here, and it still doesn't agree with this, this pattern of ones here. Um, perhaps there was one possibility for this, the number of confirmed cases to remain one for, for over a month right up until from the very last day of January, right up until almost the end of February, uh, really suggests there's not a great deal of testing, if any, was going on at all. And so these numbers could be a lot higher, all of them. Uh, the, the second recorded case occurs on the 26th of February here. And you can see the model doesn't quite fit that well, so it's a long, long way off. Where this model comes into its own is the later values. As the number of confirmed cases due to testing grows, it starts to agree with the number predicted by the model. And so the model becomes a better fit later on as time goes on. All right, keep going here. 9th of, 19th of March. Okay, keep going down. 1st of April. 2nd and so on down. 6th of April. Uh, keep going down, 10th of April, here we go, getting better, and again, the 11th of April. It's a reasonable fit. It's, it's not the best, but it's reasonably tracking the actual confirmed number of cases, if not a little bit over. All right, so what does this model predict? Now, the values quoted here will not necessarily happen. This is just a prediction. The blue curve you saw in the graph earlier what does it predict in the days ahead? Like for instance, the 12th of April, it's predicting 11,876 cases. Doesn't mean that has happened or will happen. Um, coming down here, if you keep going down to the 25th of April, you have 36,271. Um, 8th of May, you have 110,776. Now I stress these are predictions. It does not mean it will happen that way. Things may change in Sweden. It may not happen that way. Um, come down to the 20th of May, you have 310,481. Keep going down to 31st of May, you have 798,591. And then finally, 3rd of June, it crosses over the 1 million mark. And that's a prediction. If Sweden carries on the way it's going, this model is predicting that by the 3rd of June, there'll be just over a million cases. All right, <clears throat> 1 million 33,289 cases. 
All right. So this model predicts that Sweden will have 11,876 confirmed cases by the 12th of April, which is yesterday by my time. Now, in all of the hospitals in Sweden, there are roughly between 480 and 580 ICU beds. And that's the key factor in, in why we need to minimise the spread of the virus, because there is a limited capacity in hospitals to deal with um, people who, who suffer severe consequences of the illness. Now, the first figure, 480, I took from this website. The second figure, 580, I took from this website here. Um, you can check those for yourselves. Now, about 20% of those infected with this virus require hospital treatment with some or all requiring an ICU bed. Um, maybe, maybe not. So, some just need some assistance with oxygen, um, but some need to be ventilated. Uh, so let's just say if we said only 5% of those infected require an ICU bed, then Sweden reaches its limit when 11,876 people are infected, which as we've seen is the 12th of April just yesterday. Since 5% of 11,876 is 590, that places the number of the demand for ICU beds just slightly over the actual number that, that is available in the country. So clearly time to act is running out. The limits of the hospital system are being reached as this video is being made. So how does Sweden compare with Australia? Now, early on in the pandemic, Australia appeared to adopt the idea of achieving herd immunity in some sort of controlled way, or even possibly not in a controlled way. Um, now, in that sense, we were following the uh, British government um, uh, who had taken to this idea, and it looked like Australia was intending to go down the same path. Now, fortunately, the UK government gave up on the idea um, after a bit of mathematical modelling, and then Australia followed suit. But Sweden, on the other hand, appears to be still pursuing the idea of building herd immunity in some sort of way, whether that's controlled or not. But it seems with just allowing the population to become infected and then hope that people gain some kind of immunity. All right, well, let's have a look at the Australian case because Australia moved right away from that and then says, as in recent weeks, been taking strict me measures, shutting down its schools, shutting down gyms, restaurants, um, all the rest of public places, people not allowed to gather in numbers of more than two, people restricted to their homes, no unnecessary journeys, just uh, only allowed to go out to get food. Um, yeah, so it's been a much firmer, much stricter lockdown in Australia by far than has been the case in Sweden, which has been fairly open and generous. As you can see, the best fitting curve to the data for Australia as of the 11th of April is this one, which does not in any way fit the data very well at all. As you can see, here's the actual confirmed number of cases is in red for each day from the same website I used before. And you can see that no way does this curve here with this equation here, it's not a good fit at all. Australia has been able to reduce the rate of infection quite, quite strongly. As you can see here in the last recent days, no longer is it so much exponential from about after about this day here, it's really started to turn the curve over and downwards. So each day only a small number of being added on it is certainly not exponential. So this data here could not be described as being exponential. You can see that the best fit the uh, exponential curve that the mathematical package I use can produce for this curve is this one here, which clearly does not fit. So Australia's growth is no longer exponential in nature, no longer. It's been able to really flatten that curve quite a bit. Let's compare the two countries now. If you look at Sweden with its exponential growth in cases, population of Sweden is just over 10 million. The population of Australia is 25 and a half million almost, 25 and a half. Number of confirmed cases in Sweden as of the 11th of April was 10,151 actual reported confirmed cases. Whereas in Australia, the actual number of confirmed reported cases was 6,303. Even though Australia has two and a half times the population of Sweden, roughly two and a half times the population of Sweden, it still has a lower number of confirmed cases, almost half that of Sweden, a little bit more than half that of Sweden. 
the number of deaths in Sweden has been 887, whereas in Australia, as of the 11th of April, the number of deaths has been 56. And the difference really comes down to the approach between the two. Australia has locked down in recent weeks its community and the, the rate of infection has slowed markedly and the curve is flattening. Sweden has not locked its population down and the number of cases is still growing pretty well exponentially. All right, now the concept of herd immunity in the form embraced early on in this pandemic by the UK, uh, which is no longer following now, is now a discredited idea. It is incorrect, it is a wrong approach to take. And some experts in the field, for instance, this Dr. William Hunniger, I hope I pronounced the name correctly there, Professor in Evolution and Epidemiology of Infectious Diseases at Harvard, um, pointed out in The Guardian uh, that such a policy would result in large numbers of people dying, and that, that's what the British government found when it did some modelling, and so completely changed direction and, and put aside the idea of herd immunity and realised it was not going to work because the NHS would be severely overwhelmed. They would have a death toll of 250, 260,000 people and a hospital system that, that would be unable to cope. Now, um, now he points out that um, herd immunity is typically achieved by widespread vaccination against the disease. Well, there's no vaccine for COVID-19, so the, the idea of herd immunity was completely wrong. Allowing people to become infected, allowing people to simply become infected and then somehow they would develop immunity after that was very much wishful thinking and there's no evidence whatsoever that that would work at all. There is no vaccine, as he points out, this professor, there's no vaccine for COVID-19 and herd immunity without a vaccine assumes that the vast majority of people who recover from the coronavirus will then be immune. And that has not yet been conclusively established. There is no guarantee that people getting this virus will become immune to it. Uh, as an example, have a look at the common cold, the common cold virus, it's a virus, um, but we get it every year, it keeps coming back. We're not immune to it. We've never developed any immunity to it. It's a virus which continually returns to the community. Um, and the hope of the vaccine too may be decades away, it may not come. Look at the AIDS virus, there's still no vaccine for it. So there's no guarantee. So this idea we can just let the virus rip in the community and, and, and infect as many people as it likes um, on the basis of somehow we'll gain immunity when there's absolutely no evidence that any immunity will be gained is very, very dangerous, very dangerous. And the point of me making this video is to point out that staying on the current course will result in Sweden's healthcare system being overwhelmed by this virus and tremendous amount of loss of life and unnecessary suffering. Time to lock the community down. It's time to stop.